The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Looking Beyond the Horizon in Gastroesophageal Cancers, Updated Evidence on How Systemic Therapies Are Redefining Care. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash ZKG860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, uh, and welcome to our program. I'm Elena Janjigian, a medical oncologist and chief of GI oncology service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. And it's such a pleasure to welcome my colleague and friend, Dr. Jaffer Ajani, who's also a medical oncologist at MD Anderson in Texas. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining. So today we have a very comprehensive program and an overview uh, for the current approaches and also looking beyond the horizon in the management of gastroesophageal cancers. There's been a lot of development in the last uh, few years, and we will summarize the evidence-based approach to treatment of these diseases and how systemic therapies are redefining care for this disease. So the goals of our program today is to give you an overview of the latest clinical evidence and guidelines recommendations supporting uh, the use of this, uh, uh, these approaches, both immunotherapy and targeted agents for patients with early stage and metastatic gastric and gastroesophageal cancer. We will share our strategies to help create personalized treatment plans for each individual patients with the gastric and gastroesophageal cancers and also provide guidance on how to use a holistic, multidisciplinary, team-based approach to prevent and to address immune-related and adverse events associated with this systemic uh, treatments in the modern age. So we have several modules and we'll uh, alternate and take turns. I will start off uh, the discussion and this will be relatively interactive and we have some uh, cases that we brought from our clinical practice. So uh, stay tuned and it'll be uh, a fun and informative discussion. So I'll kick us off with the first module for applying a personalized approach for the management of the disease, particularly for the important biomarker of HER2 positive disease uh, for stage four patients and how we approach targeted therapies, what has been the recent breakthroughs. And so by way of background, real world evidence suggests, uh, and this is data that was collected uh, from the health records over the uh, course of seven years, ending in 2018, so before some of the current data uh, came out. But nonetheless, over 3,000 patients with advanced disease uh, and uh, sobering uh, data to suggest that some of these patients don't even get a biomarker tested in clinical practice. So it's so important for us to remember that Routine biomarker testing, especially for HER2, which is a validated biomarker for over a decade, is very important. And furthermore, we noticed that in first-line setting, up to 25% of patients uh, did not receive any biomarker testing uh, or treatment after their diagnosis. Um, and uh, only about 60% uh, of patients received uh, HER2-directed therapies for patients with HER2-positive disease. So it just reminds us uh, that uh, 20 to 30 percent of tumors are HER2 positive, and if we are able to identify those patients, we really can make a difference for their treatment, um, first and second line, where HER2-directed therapy uh, is now available. So we'll uh, review the data that supports this approach and hopefully remind everyone and inspire them to routinely test for biomarkers. So where are we? Certainly, HER2-directed antibody trastuzumab has been approved uh, in the United States and many countries globally since 2009 uh, for use of HER2 positive tumors. We define it usually by IHC3 plus or IHC2 plus and then fish positivity where we look at the ratio um, and define it by anything greater than 2.0, uh, which is considered to be amplified. Based on Keynote 811 data, we also use now a standard uh, use of pembrolizumab plus trastuzumab in first-line HER2 positive patients. And recently that label was amended to specify that tumors have to be pdl one positive as well, de defined by combined positivity score of one or greater, uh, which is the uh, majority of these patients, over 80% of those tumors. Uh, 
In second line, after Trastuzumab progression, Trastuzumab Duraxtecan is now also FDA approved, and we do recommend retesting for HER2 after Trastuzumab progression to confirm that the biomarker is still present. In gastric cancer, uh, is more so than in breast cancer. We have a loss of HER2 and heterogeneity of HER2, so it's important to know whether or not the biomarker still exists before we decide to use the uh, HER2 directed therapy in second line. So let's review the biology of HER2. As you know, it's a, it's a receptor that is part of a receptor superfamily. So HER2 is, uh, is a transmembrane receptor, it's a growth factor. And the other uh, cousins or uh, relatives in that family are EGFR, which is HER1, HER3, uh, HER um, and HER4. And these receptors have, are very important for growth of, and proliferation of many tumors, including lung cancer, certainly breast cancer, gastric cancer, and, and colon cancer. In gastric cancer, more so than other tumors, uh, the complicated uh, picture here is because of co-occurring alterations uh, and activation of downstream signaling, as we should summarize here, of MAP kinase and APT signaling that ultimately uh, uh, leads to proliferation uh, and increasing in invasiveness of the tumors uh, and complicates targeting of HER2. So where it's, HER2 is not the only uh, oncogene that drives the cancer growth uh, and uh, has complicated the drug development in our field. So what else do we know about HER2? Well, uh, trastuzumab in particular works through uh, inhibition of HER2, but also by activating uh, ADCC and causing immune-related effects on the tumor. We found uh, back in 2009 that addition of trastuzumab plus chemotherapy in HER2 positive patients in this TOGA study results in the survival benefit with median OS of 13.8 months and uh, compared to 11.1 months uh, with chemotherapy alone with hazard ratio of 0.74. What's interesting is that HER2 overexpression is actually a better biomarker to select uh, for uh, this uh, patient population. In the TOGA study, when the FISH uh, patients, uh, positive patients were examined as, as a compo uh, compared to IHC3 plus positive patients, in the IHC3 plus positive population or IHC2 plus FISH positive population, the magnitude of benefit was even greater, uh, close to four months of uh, median OS benefit. So that's how we select those patients in the clinic. Um, and it's important, and I want to remind and urge all of you to please routinely biomarker test uh, all of your patients. When you look in the subgroup analysis, as I mentioned, uh, tumors that were fish positive by, but IHC negative uh, derive very little benefit. In fact, as you see, the uh, hazard ratio uh, crosses one, uh, and it's, the confident inter uh, intervals are quite wide. Uh, but in the uh, HER2 positive population, um, the way that we define it in our clinic, the benefit is quite robust. So uh, I just uh, want to um, encourage everyone to do uh, biomarker testing, particularly since HER2 IHC uh, comes back relatively quickly um, and we're able to get these results in the clinic in real time. The NCCN guidelines uh, do recommend testing um, here uh, and, uh, and it should be done routinely. Why are uh, the treatment options so limited for gastric cancer? Well, so since after the TOGA study, there's been uh, several negative uh, studies in our uh, clinics. Uh, and here's a very nice summary of uh, this data. So targeting HER2 with just better, with better HER2 inhibitors or dual HER2 inhibition with lapatinib and trastuzumab or pertuzumab and trastuzumab did not meaningfully improve outcomes over the TOGA. Um, and uh, both Jacob, Eloise, and Logic studies were negative. Uh, second line studies as well, uh, uh, the Titan and the Gatsby study and so on were negative. And the reason why is that because of this complicated biology where HER2 interacts with EGFR and MET, also heterogeneity in HER2 and gastric cancer uh, led to these negative efforts. It should not discourage you from biomarker testing because Again, in subset of patients, this biology is quite important, and we were able to overcome this difficulty um, and overcome the dry spell of negative studies with this positive study, where 
uh, beyond the HER2 axis, where we're able to target HER2 biology and the underlying principle that trastuzumab activity uh, through immune-related uh, effect really needs to be augmented further, particularly because as the patient stayed on trastuzumab, the level of pdl one already high at baseline continued to increase as a mechanism of resistance to trastuzumab. So we did a phase two study that showed dramatic improvement in overall response rate with combination of pembrolizumab and trastuzumab and chemotherapy. This led to a phase three study that eventually changed practice in this disease. So after a decade of negative studies, Keynote 811 demonstrated that a survival benefit for addition of pembrolizumab to trastuzumab in chemotherapy against placebo. So a few words about the study. This was a global study. Over 600 patients, close to 700 patients were treated. And patients were selected by HER2 status using IHC3 plus or IHC2 plus fish positivity. So not exactly what the TOGA regimen did, which has used uh, fish positivity primarily. Patients were stratified by PDL1 status, but PDL1 status was positivity was not an entry requirement. Um, and as I mentioned, over 80% of tumors that are HER2 positive are also PDL1 positive, but not all. Uh, and uh, this is you know modern study that included patients and treated them with oxaliplatin-based regimen, which again highlights uh, what should be the standard now in all the clinics. Um, it's important to consider. So uh, let's look at the response rate. So uh, as I mentioned in the TOGA study, the response rate with uh, chemotherapy plus trastuzumab was 47%. Here it was 52%, so the comparator arm actually did quite well. Uh, again, highlighting the modern way to select for biomarker right, uh, enrichment, which is IHC3 plus, uh, IHC2 plus fish positive. And also the modern regimens, the oxaliplatin is likely better tolerated, overall better dose density. Um, and despite that, the overall response rate was improved in addition to pembrolizumab, 74%, uh, compared to 51%, which is quite nice. Overall response rate difference uh, was robust and meaningful. Um, what, what also is noted is uh, that uh, with longer follow-up in the uh, follow-up of the interim analysis three, uh, the response rate in the placebo arm continued to improve uh, with longer follow-up. And despite that, the delta was still meaningful. Um, and uh, based on this delta in the first interim analysis, the, response, the FDA actually approved this regimen already in the United States. Um, and the follow-up analyses confirmed the survival benefit. So looking at the update that was presented at ESMO and also published in Lancet uh, just earlier, uh, you know, a few months ago, uh, we were able to demonstrate progression-free survival in uh, all patients and also patients selected by biomarker by CPS1 or greater. Um, the hazard ratio is 0.7, median progression-free survival of 10.8 months compared to 7.2 months. And when you look at the updated overall response rate, again, once again, the placebo arm continued to do uh, well. And then despite that, uh, you were still uh, able to improve on the outcomes. Um, the, um, it's important uh, to note that the overall, overall survival data was also presented and it's available for your review. It was not included in this presentation, but you are able to see it online in, in the Lancet publication. And the overall survival, particularly for pd one CPS1 or greater population, was also improved. Uh, and this led to the approval of this regimen, both in Europe and the United States um, and other uh, countries. Uh, we are waiting for the final overall survival, and that's why uh, the, this data is not yet complete. So what about second line setting? Well, we know that HER2 is important in the first line. How do we approach this disease in second line? And as I summarized earlier, there were many negative studies before we get to a positive uh, destiny gastric 01 study uh, with this antibody drug conjugate. In gastric cancer, the admixture of HER2 positive with HER2 negative cells, the you know, difference in even histology within each individual tumor or metastatic site. So for example, the poorly differentiated cells uh, coexisting with you know, moderately differentiated cells, cells that are HER2 positive um, creates this opportunity for uh, mixed responses and heterogeneity. 
And so this drug, trastuzumab direct stecan, has an advantage. Uh, unlike other ADCs, it has a, a very high drug to antibody ratio. And so the way these ADCs are uh, constructed is that you have a HER2 positive moiety that's linked to a cytotoxic agent. In this case, unlike, let's say, TDM1, the high drug antibody ratio of 1 to 8 and the high potency payload, which is an topotecan or irinotecan like drug, creates an opportunity for a more robust anti tumor response, but also bystander effect. Where preclinically, we see if we put uh, uh, two cell lines and graft them into the same mouse and have uh, them coexist. Uh, there is a bystander effect to a HER2 negative uh, you know, tumor uh, cells as, as long as a HER2 positive tumor cells are also binding this drug and um, are able to undergo apoptosis. So uh, TDXD is an important drug in our disease because it resur resurrected the hope and the possibility of targeting HER2 beyond a progression in first line setting. Um, and this was based on Destiny Gastric 01 and Destiny Gastric 02 study. So the 01 study was in third line setting and it was randomized against investigator choice uh, chemotherapy, which is usually a taxine or a UTCAN based regimen. And this was study done outside of the United States and this was the, uh, the bottom panel, so mostly in Japan and Taiwan. And patients were randomized to receive trastuzumab direct stecan in third line setting or standard chemotherapy. And as you can see here, the median OS for TDXD was 12.5 months, progression free survival of 5.6 months, and confirmed oral response rate was 43%. So just by this data alone, the FDA was uh, so hopeful to get this drug to the patients that the uh, regimen was approved in the United States. Um, uh, trastuzumab direct stecan after trastuzumab progression. And uh, in the label, in the, in the US label, the recommendation is to re-biopsy patients if feasible and safe to ensure that the tumor is still HER2 positive. Destiny Gastric 02 was a confirmatory study that we did, just a single arm study in the United States, in Europe, and, uh, and Western countries. Uh, and again, confirmed the overall response rate. And although it was a second line study, the overall response rate is very similar to what was seen in the third line setting. Again, suggesting that there's a similarity in biology and the common denominator, that if you're HER2 positive and have this driver, that you would continue to benefit in second or third line. The adverse event profile of this, this is chemotherapy. You cannot forget that. We have chemotherapy related adverse events and if you use it in later lines, sometimes the, the bone marrow suppression um, and the ability to deliver the drug uh, on time and reliably can be impaired. So typically I try to do it in second line for at least HER2 positive patients that are confirmed. Inst interstitial lung disease, so lung inflammation is a major uh, serious adverse event that can happen. It's rare. And as long as you monitor your patients, um, it's, it can be safe and uh, deaths uh, are unlikely if you discontinue the treatment early on. So the current status and the next steps for trastuzumab direct stecan, we are doing several investigations to try to bring it to first line in combination with uh, capecitabine or 5 few based regimens and immunotherapy. And the confirmatory destiny gastric 04 is open worldwide to confirm the, that this is uh, still should be the standard uh, in second line uh, in eight patients like, uh, you know, in Korea and Japan. So this is the practice uh, for United States and other, and for our patients. In first line, we typically prefer pembrolizumab, trastuzumab chemotherapy. Um, and then in second line, it's trastuzumab direct stecan. If we rebiopsy and the tumor is HER2 negative, in second line, the plan is for uh, taxol remiseramab, and then we could still use TDXD in third line. In fact, that's what I prefer to do. And we sometimes still see responses, again, because of heterogeneity. Just because you didn't find it on one biopsy does not mean that the HER2 is not there. So management of interstitial lung disease is important to, not, uh, to monitor patients. I look at the scans myself to uh, look at the ground glass classifications um, and to look for these subtleties and changes. If you pick up these changes before the symptoms go on, 
uh, the patients typically do find with those uh, interruptions or discontinuation. Um, we don't recommend additional scanning or imaging. So whatever the cancer monitoring that you do is sufficient. I don't recommend uh, pulmonary function tests at baseline or anything like this in clinical practice. Just close follow-up and the monitoring is very important. And at first sign of radiographic concern, talk to your pulmonology colleagues, review the scans and consider stopping the treatment. So emerging data, uh, HER2 is a very exciting topic and many important studies ongoing, so keep an eye out. Suffice it to say, please biomarker test your patients because if you don't look for in for this biomarker, you won't know it exists. And then if available, refer patients to clinical trials. Um, we have a case that we wanted to discuss and perhaps we can uh, take turns uh, discussing our approach. So this is a patient who is a seven-year-old woman presented with with typical presentation of gastric cancer, early satiety, and fullness, was found to have metastatic disease in her lungs. Um, she has really good support uh, in her family and is, wants to be aggressive despite her uh, you know, uh, disease. Her tumor is her 2 positive pd one positive CPS20. She's independent and active. And uh, what uh, regimen would you consider giving this patient? Jaffer, perhaps uh, I can ask you that question in your clinic. What would you offer this patient now? Hi. So the preference would be to add pembrolizumab. And I would certainly not use uh, cisplatinum. Maybe you can comment on that. But, you know, one would check for any contraindication of uh, PD-1 inhibitor. And that, that would be the only restriction. I don't think it adds to morbidity that much. You have to monitor them. Absolutely. I completely agree. And uh, if, so this patient, I think practically we need to decide whether or not we would do capecitabine or infusional 5-FU. Often in patients, uh, the preference is really to try to do full FOX as uh, they tolerate it better, especially if the patient is older and may have reduced uh, uh, kidney function, even if the creatinine is normal, I would say an octogenarian still c calculate the glomerular fr filtration rate. It's very important. Um, and uh, I would not use cisplatin. Uh, I would completely agree. Use oxaliplatin. So if the patient is able to swallow uh, pills and would prefer every three-week regimen, we would usually keep cytobine. Oxaliplatin would be the preferred regimen with trastuzumab and pembrolizumab. Alternatively, you could use full fox trastuzumab every two weeks with pembrolizumab every six weeks. Um, and let's uh, make it a little bit more complicated and make the tumor HER2 positive, but, but PDL1 CPS less than one. Uh, what would you recommend, Jaffer? Yeah, so in this case, I think uh, the data that you mentioned from Keynote 811. Uh, it doesn't support the use of pembrolizumab, so I would, I would not add pembrolizumab. Just chemotherapy, trastuzumab. Yeah, exactly. Um, and for those patients, if you do have an option for a clinical trial, for example, if Destiny Gastric Zero Three is open, um, if you're able to enroll uh, on a trial, it's it's the best approach. And even even if the trial involves immunotherapy together with her to direct therapy, I wouldn't preclude participation in the trial. I think the data for addition of immunotherapy in those patients is still preliminary and still reading out, but uh, suffice it to say, we know that pembrolizumab, trastuzumab chemotherapy may not uh, benefit those patients as, mu as much, uh, but we don't th really think that, you know, th that they should be excluded from trastuzumab or uh, immunotherapy approaches in, stand in clinical trials. Okay, so, um, Let's assume that this patient did well uh, for, uh, for a while on fluoropyrimidine plus oxaliplatin and trastuzumab and uh, pembrolizumab. So, and uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, she progressed uh, with uh, a new lesion. And now her functional status still remains uh, adequate for treatment. You were able to get a biopsy and found that the tumor is still HER2 positive, IHC3+. Uh, what regimen would you recommend in that case? So here, uh, again, you know, I would look for any pre-existing pulmonary conditions. And 
so obviously this patient seems to be doing very well. Uh, so I would prefer TDXD over RAM factor taxol here. Um, and and uh, of course, monitor them carefully, educate the patient and family members. I think that's very important. Monitoring and education, your patients are your best um, you know, reporters. Uh, and presence of lung metastasis per se is not an exclusion criteria. So if, I, if you remember, this woman had lung metastasis. We've given patients uh, with uh, lung metastasis TDXD and they've done well. It's just important to monitor and uh, keep an eye on any findings, even subtle findings of ground glass fabrication. Sometimes the impression part of the scan may not note it, um, note it, but you really have to keep an eye on it. Um, so in summary, the insights and safety ma management. So for patients uh, in first line setting, it's standard. Uh, monitoring and what we usually recommend is, re and again, this is part of our institutional guidelines, but we do, although the decline in injection fraction is very rare, our institution does recommend uh, checking uh, the echocardiograms up to every three to four months. And usually I do it around the scan times uh, in first line or second line. Uh, the immune related adverse events from Kinoid 11 were relatively rare actually, and overall the adverse event profile from the two regimens uh, were similar uh, in the Keynote 811, so placebo or uh, pembrolizumab addition. So that's good. Uh, that's a good point that this regimen is very well tolerated, pembrolizumab, trastuzumab, and chemotherapy. And uh, as you mentioned, in second line with trastuzumab, durox, tecan, this is chemotherapy. So you will get the neutropenia and the liver toxicity, and again, important to monitor ventricular function and as we mentioned, an intrastitial lung disease uh, is a rare but serious adverse event. So in summary, uh, the TOGA is established that it's important to test to HER2, and Keynote 811 uh, brought the new excitement of HER2-directed therapies and the hope uh, that patients will live longer and better life. We see median OS of 20 months uh, with pembrolizumab, trastuzumab chemotherapy, so critical to test for HER2. Uh, in first and then in second line, because now in second line we have TDXD that's also routine. So a great biomarker, you know, whenever I see a HER2 positive patient uh, in my clinic, it's, uh, it's a good day and it really makes my week. So uh, don't uh, waste that opportunity to, just to give someone the good news. So um, I'd like to pivot now to Dr. Ajani, who will discuss the modern immunotherapy approaches uh, and where things stand and what, what the future of, uh, in, uh, for these patients. Thank you, Jaffa, go ahead. Hi, I would like to summarize the standard of care for upper GI cancer patients uh, based on the recently completed studies. So we'll talk about the first line therapy predominantly in gastroesophageal adenocarcinomas. So uh, before the advent of immunotherapy, we used to talk about the median survival, I remember eight months, 10 months, uh, then one year. But now with the addition of uh, especially PD-1 inhibitors, the median survival has gone up to 15 months and in some trials even uh, higher than that. So the drugs that are already approved uh, for us to use or nivolumab plus chemotherapy um, in the first line setting. And the FDA has approved this uh, irrespective of the PDL1 status. Pembrolizumab, trastuzumab, and chemotherapy for HER2 positive patient, especially PDL1 positive patients. And pembrolizumab is approved uh, for high TMB or MSR high tumors. So let's see what, what else. Uh, what, what the data are for these. So there are three very important trials that uh, we would like to summarize. Uh, Dr. Janjikian already mentioned the Keynote 811. So I'm not going to repeat that, but let's uh, review Checkmate 649, uh, which was in gastric, G junction, and esophageal cancer patients for adenocarcinoma. And the arm that succeeded was the NEVO plus chemo versus chemo in first-line setting, uh, resulting in 
higher, much higher response rates. A PFS hazard ratio of 0.68 and also survival advantage. The other really important trial is Keynote 859, which was recently published. This was limited to gastric and GE junction patients, adenocarcinoma. Um, again, Pembro plus chemo versus chemo uh, was compared and Pembro plus chemo uh, was much better. So uh, again, in the PFS uh, was much improved. OS, the hazard ratio was 0.76. Um, I'm sorry, the PFS was 0.76 and uh, OS advantage was uh, 1.4 month. So let's look into a little more details of Checkmate 649. This uh, turned out to be the largest uh, trial in this space ever done. And the arms, uh, the experimental arm that succeeded was Nevo plus chemo, particularly in patients who had high CPS, and that is defined as CPS score of five or higher. And here you can see on the left, the overall survival advantage uh, at different time points uh, with three months of median difference, 0.71 hazard ratio and highly uh, strong p-value and also positive for all randomized patients. So the, the next trial, which is very large, is almost 1,500 patients, is Keynote 859. And this had a very simple design. First line setting, untreated patients, metastatic, and uh, comparison was Pembro plus chemo versus chemo alone. And this also resulted in survival advantage, as you can see on the left side, um, with uh, particularly in patients who had high CPS. And here the high CPS was defined as 10 or higher. And on the right side is the PFS advantage uh, for these patients. So, uh, in other words, pembrolizumab is performing very similar to nivolumab in the same patient population in almost the same setting. So, we, we should uh, just mention that when you add uh, immunotherapy or PD1 inhibitor to chemotherapy, you are going to get a uh, few additional side effects. The good thing is that we are all used to adding immunotherapy to chemotherapy, so we are very familiar with the side effects. And the other thing is that immunotherapy doesn't exacerbate effects of chemotherapy, and chemotherapy does not exacerbate. So these are uh, additive but not synergistic side effects. So what is coming? Uh, uh, ahead of us um, is number of trials. This is not the whole list of it, but uh, LEAP15 will be using uh, lenvatinib uh, in addition to immunotherapy and chemotherapy. Uh, the other molecule that is of great interest is the TIGIT as a target, and there are anti-TIGIT um, trials that are being done. The other one is DKK1, which is in the wind pathway. And uh, this is currently being done in a phase two randomized setting, and there's a lot of interest in that. Of GFR2B protein, so it's a monoclonal antibody against the protein, but FGFR family of uh, receptors are a big target in, in GI space. Claudine 18.2 is another new target. This, there are a number of trials that I will mentioned much later on today. Um, and then there are, as I mentioned, there are many more trials um, ongoing. So I'd like to present this case and get Dr. Jinjigian's opinion. Um, Jeffrey is a 64-year-old gentleman, unfortunately newly diagnosed with stage four cancer, poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, uh, performance status is uh, one, and uh, he um, had some biomarkers done according to the NCCN guidelines, and it turns out to be HER2 negative. PDL1 is positive with CPS of 
uh, more than five. And uh, we don't have the MS, oh, sorry, microsatellite is stable. So if this patient uh, had a variety of CPS scores, uh, Elena, so how would you handle uh, the treatment uh, recommendations? It's a great question. It's a very typical presentation for this patient. Uh, and um, uh, the for the CPS five or greater, the answer is easy. Usually those patients in my clinic get five a few oxaliplatin plus um, immune checkpoint blockade, either in Evolumab, uh, more commonly because it just lends itself well with full fox um, or pembrolizumab. Um, I think when you're approaching these patients, critical information is uh, what are their baseline uh, comorbidities? As we mentioned earlier, when we were discussing the HER2 positive case, uh, any history of immune related you know, diseases. And increasingly, even in patients with vitiligo or other you know, thyroiditis, uh, at baseline, we're able to use immunotherapy with no problems. Um, so uh, we routinely test for CPS, and if uh, the tumor is PD-L1 positive, the answer is easy. For those intermediate cases, uh, for CPS zero, certainly the immunotherapy is not unlikely to help. Um, anything between one and five, I, my preference typically is to use immunotherapy, uh, particularly since if you don't use it in, in first-line setting, in the United States, we don't have access to it in second or third line setting. Um, and also because the biomarker testing is not that reliable. We've had patients, for example, that tested um, negative outside and we retested here and they were positive or vice versa. Um, there's just a lot of um, issues with this biomarker test for CPS that I don't necessarily preclude patients from receiving immunotherapy um, just by, based on one result particularly since the FDA does allow use of immunotherapy irrespective of PD-1. Okay, thank you. And I think we will now ask you to summarize the role of immunotherapy in localized uh, upper GI cancers. Yeah. You know, I think uh, the more patients we can cure, the better. Uh, most of our patients present with metastatic disease. There's a population of patients that present with early stage disease. And so the ability to remove the tumor completely um, and to treat micrometastatic disease is really what drives survival. So why is immunotherapy important uh, in surgical setting? Well, uh, critical it is to uh, be able to suppress micrometastasis. And we know that based on uh, Checkmate 577 study, immunotherapy can be used in adjuvant setting. Uh, while uh, being able to do it in perioperative setting is still under the investigation, uh, particularly since in our patients, most patients present uh, with uh, stage two or three disease where we know surgery alone is not sufficient. But we also want to do as much therapy before surgery because pr uh, practically in adjuvant setting, um, the likelihood that everyone's going to be able to complete systemic therapy uh, while they're still learning how to eat and sleep normally after the, this big surgery um, is, uh, is, is a challenge. So what do we uh, think about uh, with uh, chemotherapy is, um, well, how do we get an R0 resection? And what we've learned is that typically addition of radiation therapy helps improve uh, the R0 resection, but not necessarily the survival. And what is the optimal surrogate of survival? Uh, what we've learned also increasingly that the complete pathologic response rate is not an optimal surrogate for survival. Not every study that shows P PCR improvement also translate to survival benefit. Um, and so uh, it's really important to consider how do we augment the micro environment post uh, chemotherapy, uh, post chemo radiation, um, and help um, uh, uh, augment the, uh, uh, the tumor milieu and uh, treat the micrometastasis. So immune microenvironment post chemo radiation um, is one of the uh, topics that's been under consideration.
So um, the first study that brought uh, immunotherapy to perioperative set setting is, of course, Checkmate 577 study. Um, one challenge was to come up with one common denominator of which patients to study, because in the United States, some patients go on to get chemo, some patients get chemo radiation, um, some get surgery first. So Checkmate 577 uh, was a study that started many years ago and initially actually struggled to finish a call, but it, uh, we are glad that it did. Um, and it used uh, patients that uh, had residual disease as their main goal to help. So key eligibility criteria was adeno or squamous patients, which, you know, obviously we don't do that anymore, but at the time was still acceptable. And patients who received chemo radiation and had surgery and had residual tumor either in the primary tumor or lymph node status, despite getting standard of care chemo RT and then surgery. So these were considered high risk because most of those patients, if you had node positive or residual tumor in place, will recur within a year. So then patients were randomized to receive nivolumab or placebo. And the primary endpoint of median disease-free survival was met with, as you can see here, the curves initially come together, uh, but then separate after first three months of adjuvant therapy with hazard ratio 0.67, uh, with 22.4 months uh, median disease-free survival compared to 10.4 months for placebo. And this was at 30, uh, 32 months follow-up and, uh, and so sustained. Distant metastasis-free survival was also meaningfully improved. Um, and that's uh, something we worry about is not only, uh, you know, uh, survival, survival, overall survival, but also uh, recurrence-free and distant metastasis. So uh, in our practice, we do use adjuvant nivolumab. And then the question is, do we need to restrict it only in patients who got chemo RT and surgery? For now, that's what the guidelines recommend. So uh, what about the future? Well, we know that most of our patients, even G-junction patients, uh, really don't get radiation anymore. And so what we've recommended is really to consider enrolling in clinical trials that use chemotherapy in perioperative setting. For G-junction and gastric cancer, the standard has been perioperative FLOT, but that's a relatively recent standard. And historically, uh, two-drug chemotherapy has been used in Asia. So Keynote 585 looked at uh, localized gastric and gastroesophageal cancer tumors and looked at a combination of capecitabine, and cisplatin with pembrolizumab. And the first interim analysis was used, and this is a, a learning uh, sort of uh, point for many who are designing studies. Alpha was split over uh, interim analysis and the final analysis. And although the first interim analysis was positive, with a delta of 10.9, the path CR rate was meaningfully improved, both in the pembrolizumab arm when used with two drugs, but also in a small uh, uh, cohort of three drug combination with FLOT, the delta was meaningful. Uh, when we looked at, when these re uh, results were presented at ESMO uh, to look at final survival, um, unfortunately, although the curves, as you can see here, separate uh, the, and you know, the hazard ratio does not cross one, uh, the, there was no meaningful improvement statistically, again, probably because of the alpha consideration. Um, the uh, tw 24 months uh, was uh, numerically higher in 36 months uh, survival, event-free survival, but this was not clinically meaningful or, did, or uh, statistically significant, uh, which is the same for overall survival. So this did not change practice uh, and is a cautionary tale of interim analyses and also perhaps, you know, that the two drug combination is not an optimal backbone. Um, and it's too soon to know what, what would be the practice changing study. What we have done also is certainly uh, looked at the combination of immunotherapy plus uh, three drug combination. This was the phase three Matterhorn study that was presented in the same session and is still ongoing. Simpler study, larger study, 900 patients as a result, Derva plus a FLOT versus FLOT placebo. Um, and uh, uh, these patients were included with adenocarcinoma, higher proportion of patients in the West. Uh, very few patients were enrolled in Asia, but there was about 15 you know, to 20% of patients enrolled in Asia. So we will get an uh, interesting uh, global uh, perspective on the study.
And what we did uh, show is improvement in complete response rate uh, assessed both by central and investigator review. Uh, the flat uh, comparator arm certainly performed a little better than the two drug combination that we saw in the previous study. Um, and it's too soon to say, but the delta is 12%. And what was also very important to see in the study is that the downstaging of the node negative status was improved by 15%. So it gives us hope that hopefully, you know, this will translate um, to a meaningful uh, improvement uh, of survival, but that's too soon to say. So uh, with that, you know, uh, we, we can look at uh, our next case. Um, this is a 66-year-old uh, uh, person with newly diagnosed resectable G-junction adenocarcinoma, uh, excellent functional status. Uh, and uh, these patients usually present to us um, with incomplete staging. And so staging is very important for these patients. I usually look through the endoscopy report and carefully consider um, if the tumor is extending into gastric cardia, uh, I would typically recommend a laparoscopy as well as micrometastatic disease can occur in the peritoneum uh, and hinder a possibility of resection. And then uh, the next important phone call and discussion is through disease management team with your surgeon. Uh, how far is the tumor extending into the esophagus and distally into gastric cardia? to understand whether or not you need radiation to successfully complete an R0 resection. Most of these tumors are C2 or 3. Uh, in an our institution, we do not recommend radiation for those patients. Um, although it's tempting to say, let's do chemo radiation surgery and then followed by the adjuvant nivolumab. Um, so that could be considered as well. So, you know, I think for the patient like this, the options are either to do FLOT, to enroll them in a clinical trial, um, or to do chemoradiation surgery and then followed by adjuvant nivolumab. Um, Jaffer, what would you do in your institution? No, our works will be very similar approach. And I think we're also uh, reducing the use of radiation in, in several patients because of some long-term toxicities that we are seeing. Um, but immunotherapy, as, as you described very well, is useful only in the in the setting of trimodality at the moment, um, but not with uh, perioperative, postoperative um, setting at the moment. But uh, of course, more work needs to be done. And we're opening a trial to look at HER2 positivity in the setting, and uh, and uh, MSK and MD Anderson are working together to try to improve outcomes for HER2 positive disease in early stage disease, and again, using HER2 directed therapy plus immunotherapy and chemotherapy, and as Jaffer mentioned, omitting radiation, uh, because uh, radiation really uh, improves our zero resection, but does not necessarily translate to survival benefit, and the crux of the problem is systemic disease where patients recur distally. So thank you for that discussion, and why don't we move on to your next module uh, for the future directions and the biomarkers that are coming into the clinic and the testing that should be done routinely in the near future. Tell us more about that. Yeah, thank you. One of the um, issues is that we have so many PD-1 inhibitors, um, close to 25, uh, as we were told by the FDA, and they are going to review data on all of them. They seem to be performing very similarly to nivolumab and pembrolizumab. And one study that I want to mention is Rational 305 that used tislilizumab. This is very similar to the studies that I mentioned before. So tislilizumab plus chemotherapy versus placebo plus chemotherapy in the first line setting, HER2 negative, untreated patient. And when, when we look at the, the results, the hazard ratios are very similar. There's kind of interestingly, the overall survival uh, curves that are separating very late. Uh, so this could be just a heterogeneity of the population. But it is still, survival is significantly in favor of this little map plus chemo. And so is the PFS. And the side effects are very similar to what uh, we mentioned before with Nevo plus chemo or Pembro plus chemo. 
So there, there's no additional signal. Then we have uh, a lot of exciting new targets for which we have drugs. So that becomes really important in the clinic. Uh, one of them is Claudine 18.2. And this is a junction protein uh, to keep the normal cells together. And therefore it acts like a tumor suppressor. But cancer cells cannot live um, tied to other cells, particularly poorly differentiated. They cleave the junction protein and that upregulates a lot of oncogenes. So even Claudine 18.2 becomes an oncogene. And here are some examples of the IHC, which again, like other biomarkers, it is also heterogeneous. So this, this kind of challenge we will have to face. Uh, it is consistently expressed in anywhere from 25 to 35 patients. Um, and then there are a few uh, tumors that are what, what, what we can call double positives. So they can be positive for high CPS or they can be positive for HER2. And uh, so it, it will be interesting as we have more biomarkers, we will have more double positive and triple positive and will create a new challenge that, that we'll have to face up to. So uh, uh, pre before, even today in the clinic, uh, even if you have a patient with uh, Claudine 18.2 high uh, and HER2 negative and PDL1 negative, uh, I, I have no other choice but to give them chemotherapy alone. But this might change as we go forward. In addition to the Claudine 18.2 being the first uh, biomarker, first new biomarker in gastric space, will probably become a biomarker and a target for multiple tumor types. And there's a lot of interest. Here is just a listing of number of trials that are going on with different uh, types of uh, approaches with antibody, uh, cell therapy, by specifics and ADCs. So we are likely to see many, many results uh, from drugs or regimens that are targeting Claudine 18.2. So I'd like to mention these two trials that have been completed, there are about five, 600 patient trials that focused on Claudine 18.2 in first line setting and using zolbituximab plus chemo versus chemo alone strategy. And on the left is the spotlight trial, um, which showed uh, survival benefit um, when, when you add zolbituximab. So this is a, a sort of a new uh, positive finding in the space. And on the right is the GLOVE trial, which used different chemotherapy uh, Claudine 18.2 positive patients, first line setting. And when Zolbituximab was added, there is again overall survival benefit. So we have two trials kind of validating the target, validating the drug. And uh, these are the summaries of the response rate, median survival, overall survival. Um, and, and we can see that uh, the coveted endpoint uh, being PFS and OS, they're both uh, benefited uh, with the addition of Zolbituximab. Um, the, the group that has high Claudine 18.2, they usually don't have high other biomarkers. So here are some numbers, like 13 to 15% of patients have high CPS. And this may be favorable because the future trials are going to add immunotherapy to um, Claudine regimens. The other interesting target is the FGFR2. This is a very big uh, target for gastric and other tumors, especially the family of four receptor FGFR1 to four. And there are so many other drugs. A lot of these are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And the interesting thing about that is there are drugs that uh, can recapture 
uh, responses in previous in patients who have previously been exposed to FGFR inhibition. So one of the major focuses on the protein FGFR 2B in gastric cancer, which is expressed in approximately 30% of patients. And uh, this is an example of uh, targeting uh, TKI for FGFR uh, alterated uh, tumors. This is another example of using a drug um, initially for FGFR2 target, and you can see the PET scan on the left showing a lot of disease. Uh, PET scan in the middle showing considerable improvement, but then there is progression, and this can be re, re uh, the response can be reinduced with a drug such as fudibarinib. So if, if, and there is another drug that can even um, induce responses in previously resistant populations. So as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, focusing on uh, FGFR2B protein on surface of gastric cancer cells. And uh, there is uh, considerable data uh, before the phase three trial one of the trials was called FIGHT trial, and you can see the curves on the, the right lower side where the addition of uh, bemartuzumab to chemotherapy resulted in considerable overall survival in a certain population that had at least 10% of tumor cells staining for a GFR2. So these, the other targets that we tried to focus on before, but they are coming back. One is the EGFR, and there were several randomized trials that did not succeed, but we did not really select those patients by biomarkers. Uh, CMET uh, trials selected patients with biomarkers, but they were not positive. But I think there is renewed interest, especially with the ADC. Um, and here we can see a number of drugs that are uh, in the pipeline. So fortunately, there are other emerging biomarkers in gastroesophageal adenocarcinomas. So it's becoming a disease of biomarkers. Uh, in other words, we, can, we will be able to customize therapy based on biomarkers and then enhance the effect by adding immunotherapy. So KRAS amplification or mutation will, will be pursued in gastric space. HER3 is a target in gastric cancer. Even in HER2 positive tumors, HER3 can be a target. Um, and then there will be, as I mentioned, further development of CMAP, FGFR 1 to 4, uh, stromal targets such as cytokines and chemokines, and uh, of course more um, uh, more checkpoints. So I think uh, here we can recap, uh, Yelena, whether we can summarize uh, first uh, where we are now today in the clinic and then where we, we hope to, to go. So would you tell us where do you think we are compared to five years ago? And uh, then we can both discuss what the future might be. Absolutely. So typically when I think about this disease, um, we think we historically thought of it at least as two or three different subsets, right? When we initially uh, published the DCGA, the Gastric uh, Genome Atlas, um, we know that chromosomally unstable tumors are completely different biologically than genomically stable. Um, and then there's also microsatellite instability uh, driven tumors, and then, you know, the EBV subset is rare, but also is uh, unique. So I think we've done a lot uh, for small subsets of these cancers. Within chromosomal instable, instable tumors, we've been able to figure out how to target HER2. And as you mentioned, RAS, KRAS is the next one. I think one um, huge deficiency, and we started off with this, is that these big trials and the breakthroughs that we uh, 
we are able to establish, uh, we our biggest breakthrough, the next biggest breakthrough is to bring these drugs to patients all over U.S., America, you know, worldwide, to centers that don't specialize in this disease. And I think one, if one important highlight of this program today is the excitement and the importance of biomarker testing in our disease, because what you and I do in clinic and what our patients have access to, it's so important to make sure that other patients outside of tertiary cancer centers have access to the same breakthroughs. So especially, I think the challenge will be for clotin inhibitors because clotin immunohistochemistry is not a routine test that's done in other diseases. And so gastric will be the first one. Um, and uh, it's important to highlight the, uh, the future of biomarker selected population. So uh, Coming in January probably will be important to ask for clotin testing in, in your patients and continue to HER2 test as well. Uh, and the frontier for HER2 positive tumors is to subdivide and to understand how we target patients that HER2 have HER2 intermediate or low tumors. That's what's been um, the crux of some of the studies with antibody drug conjugates such as trastuzumab, deroxetecan, uh, and uh, other biomarker testing with FGFR2 inhibitors. So I think one a problem I hear often is that there, we didn't get on stained slides or the slide quality was insufficient. And most of our patients are extremely willing and able to undergo another endoscopy. Um, the good news is these tumors are, they lend themselves well to biopsies relatively easy. Uh, and all you have to do is approach your patient and they would be willing to do it. I, I see it all the time. Um, and so I would uh, really highlight the importance of knowing the tumor biology uh, and, to, and to understand how best to prioritize these regimens. As you mentioned, even for clotin positive tumors, uh, ADCs and combination blockade with clotin inhibitors plus immunotherapy will be available in the clinic in the short uh, term. We like to debulk the tumor, intensify the therapy up front. And then the next strategies uh, are actually to explore maintenance strategies with vaccines or tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as lymbatinib or regorafenib. So a lot is available. I think my challenge and what keeps me up at night is to make sure our innovation is actually getting to the patients uh, in the real world clinics, not just in tertiary cancer centers. So I think you're absolutely right. And what is helping a lot is the the ability to interrogate gastric tumors at a very deep level to identify novel targets. And the other thing is the, the, the drug conjugation or bispecific, tri-specific cell therapy vaccine, all these are rapidly moving into clinical trials. And I think more um, targets we have and more drugs we have. We may not be able to use all of them in the first line setting, but that opens up the door for second line, third line setting. All these subsets will persist and we hopefully will be able to identify different drivers at different stages of patient's journey in the clinic and then be able to help them um, by using appropriate drugs. So I think one, one thing I would like to ask you is whether you can foresee reduction in the duration of chemotherapy and reduction in intensity of chemotherapy. I know chemotherapy is not going away for another five, 10 years, but can we imagine um, being in the clinic where we you know, rarely use chemotherapy 10 years from now? Yeah, I think if you asked me this 10 years ago, I would say absolutely, Jaffer, that's the future is we're going to do less and less chemo. Uh, now me as a middle-aged oncologist, I would say um, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic, but not so hopeful that it's going to completely uh, be removed. You know, I think there's a subset of patients, about a third of the patients who have tumors that are chemotherapy resistant. And that's where we can probably figure that out early on and offer something else to the patient, perhaps either debulking surgery or other you know, forms of treatment. There is a subset, a third of the patients that we are doing nothing for with chemotherapy. Uh, but in a chemotherapy sensitive cohort of patients, 
we, I have patients who continue to respond to a 5 few platinum even six months, seven months into it. Uh, you know, I would be hesitant to stop or discontinue a chemotherapy, especially as uh, we're very, you know, good about giving these regimens with very minimal toxicity. Um, so I, this disease is too complex and too heterogeneous. It's like a reasoning with a rabid dog. Um, often, you know, you really cannot sort of be too smart with targeted agents, but in subset of patients would be able to be able to do that. I think, you know, CAR T has been a very good example of how in subset of lymphomas or leukemias, it's transformed the disease. And in our disease, where even we have a validated biomarker with that results in tumor shrinkage, such as CAR T's directed against Plotin, the duration of response is so short um, that it's been a challenge to really bring it into clinic for all. Um, so, you know, I think uh, we're not quite yet um, moving away from systemic chemotherapy. So one last thing is about using, you know, the blood for, for a variety of things, early detection, disease monitoring, disease recurrence, target identification. We didn't talk about that, but uh, that hopefully will be a big thing, not only ctDNA, but many other elements in the blood that is released by the tumor cells. So Excellent. what do you think of that? I think uh, you're right on track. You know, mi uh, monitoring disease response and minimal residual disease and forecasting and, you know, foreshadowing who need to be uh, changed uh, on their treatment or de-escalated or escalated will be a huge advantage. And I agree with you, exosomes, uh, you know, tumor circulating tumor cells, as you know, my interest, functional PET imaging, all of those tools in the future will be sort of the battle, the innovation battle. Uh, and then as our therapeutics are improving, we can get more sophisticated about monitoring. And that could be a topic of our next seminar and discussion. All right. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to uh, 